before the break, we were discussing about whether Singaporeans would accept minority president. Today, I would say that perhaps Singaporeans are a little bit more race-blind after 30 years of the GRC system. Um, the minorities might view these proposed amendments to guarantee minority representation as president as tokenism. How do you think you can convince them? I don't us? think it's tokenism. I think it's a very necessary symbolism of what we are as a multiracial society, what Singapore means, stands for, and what we aspire to be. In every multiracial society, you want to have a symbol of that togetherness, of that unity, of that mm -hmm. inclusiveness, that every community, every race is part of this society. And when it comes to the head of state in particular, I think every country pays a lot of attention to this aspect of it. So when we, when we look for a head of state and when we design a mechanism to elect a head of state or to appoint a head of state, uh, you have to bear in mind, will this produce an outcome which is multiracial and which will reflect the colour of our society, the shape of our society? And I think that is what we're trying to do with the elected president. We now have a system which is based on elections. It's a national election. We cannot be sure that it will deliver that diversity. And because of the, the preferences which, you, which we discussed just now, the charts, how people prefer somebody who's one of their own, it's not that you won't, Singaporeans will not accept another, a president of another race, but they would prefer a president of their own race. And the natural result of people preferring one of their own race is that a minority race president will find it hard to get elected. And so it's something which, can, which we should do something about and which we can do something about. What are some of the other examples that we looked at when uh, looking at the changes to the constitution? Uh, there are many multiracial societies in the world and they all have some arrangement or other. You look at the Canadians, you think they're all whites, but actually they're English-speaking Canadians and mm -hmm. French-speaking Canadians. The French-speaking Canadians are just 22% of the population. But when it comes to choosing the Governor General of Canada, they alternate. So you have one English-speaking Governor General, the next one is French-speaking, the next one is English and French-speaking, and so on. So uh, it's an over-representation over for the French speakers, but it's something which they find necessary as an accommodation for the minority. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at the New Zealanders. Uh, they, they also have a Governor General and they have become quite a diverse society uh, with significant uh, immigrants from Asia. So the previous Governor General was an Indian. He was a lawyer. His mother had come from Fiji. He was born in New Zealand, but ethnic Indian. The current Governor General is a Maori. Uh, Sir Jerry Matapare, he's a very distinguished Maori. He's, he was a chief of defence force. He served in Singapore before. And he's now the Governor General. So they choose a good man, but they also make an effort to choose a person who's from a minority group. Uh, if you look at the Swiss, they have a very interesting example. The Swiss have, as the head of state, not one person, but a federal council. Seven people which represents different languages and regions of Switzerland. So right now they've got four German speakers, three French speakers on their council, mm -hmm. seven. The council is basically the cabinet, the ministers, and then they rotate to be president of the council amongst that group, one year at a time. Okay. So you're president just for one year, and they do it this way because otherwise the Swiss Germans are two-thirds of the population, mm -hmm. and you've elected a Swiss president, I think the Swiss Germans would be at an advantage over the Swiss French or the Swiss Italians. So there are ways of doing it. We have a unique system, but we can find a way to do it. There's been some expression of concern from minorities that they don't want this to be seen as though um, that the minority presidential candidate has an easy ride into the, into the Istana as is less qualified. Yes. How, do, how will you be able I to think that's entirely that understandable and it reflects also the success of our uh, meritocracy that we've imbued this in every citizen and people want to succeed on their own merits. And nobody wants to come in on a free ride and be seen that standards have been lowered, lowered yes. for a particular race. 
And I think we have to make sure of that. So whatever mechanism we do, we have to make sure that the same qualifying criteria apply, same standards, and there cannot be any relaxation or any doubt that the person who is elected is of that quality. And there are minorities who are of the quality. Before we had elected president, uh, when it was appointed by the parliament, mm -hmm. uh, we had Yusuf Isha, we had Devan Nair, we had Benjamin Shears, we had Wee Kim Wee. Nobody ever doubted that these were eminently qualified people to be president. Would they have won elections? Well, that depends who's standing and how it's conducted. But they were appointed by parliament and they served with distinction. And I think we want a mechanism which can produce this kind of an outcome, this kind of diversity, uh, as an assured outcome, which presently we don't have. So what are some of the proposals by the Commission? How, how will it work? Uh, the, if you look at the people who went in, before the Commission mm -hmm. and uh, gave evidence and uh, made proposals, uh, all, there were several ideas which came up. I mean, for example, you could uh, rotate and he could have a Chinese and a Malay and an Indian, one after the other, and then you come back again, Chinese, Malay, Indian. Mm -hmm. You could have a team. I mean, you have a Chinese and a Malay or a Chinese and an Indian, and then uh, each one takes half a term. Uh, you could have a president, vice president, one uh, of different races. There are different ways of doing it. But I think the, probably the least intrusive and most light touch way of doing it is to say, if everything works well, we don't have to do anything. Okay. But if after a long time you have not had a president of a particular race, mm -hmm. say a four, five or six terms, you have not had a president of a particular race, then in the next election, if a qualified candidate of that race presents himself mm -hmm. or herself, then that election will be reserved for that race. And so you will be able to get a Malay or an Indian president. If no qualified uh, candidate turns up from that race, then it's open and you carry on. And then you have a free election, whoever wins, wins. The election after that, the same rules ap will apply again uh -huh. because a, a longer time will have elapsed. And again, let's see whether a qualified candidate turns up. So it's, you, you, need, you want a mechanism where if you've had a long gap, then the next election, if you have a qualified minority candidate, then the election is held only amongst a minority group. So you talked about having a white paper put up and then debated in Parliament. Do you expect to put all this in place before the next presidential election? Yes, the legislation? I think we should. I think we should. We have spent some time talking about it. It's, in fact, we've spent a long time thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And we, I floated this subject in January in Parliament, when we opened Parliament. We've had the Constitutional Commission. They've been working very hard at it for the last several months. The report is with me and we are going to publish it next week. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we have done a, not just the homework, but also the public consultation. And we are about ready to legislate. Okay, PM, let's talk again about managing sentiments. Yeah. We talked earlier about managing sentiments of the minorities. What about the majority Chinese population? Do you think they will see this as a concession to the minorities? I think uh, we are here today as a multiracial society because the majority Chinese accept that we cannot be a Chinese Chinese society. Uh, and that was so right from the beginning. Because if we had tried to be a Chinese society, use Chinese as the working language or national language, uh, and marginalize the minorities and insist on uh, uh, Chinese dominance in all areas. I think that it would have been a very unhappy and ultimately an, a failed Singapore. But because the Chinese Singaporeans of that generation uh, had a broad approach, understood that they had to give space to the minorities, that they had to go the extra step to make the minorities feel comfortable living in Singapore, pursuing their way of life, having opportunities like everybody else and not being disadvantaged. That is why we are able to get here today and have a multiracial society. So I think if they look at the elected president changes in that spirit, mm -hmm. that this is part of being a harmonious, happy, multiracial society, then I think that people will understand and will accept and will support. We are not in a situation where 
the minorities are demanding something and the majority is pushing back and say we don't want it. I think it is something which we need to do. I'm pushing this not because I feel pressure from the minorities or because uh, we need to make a political gesture, but because I think it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. It's not nobody is asking, but I think it is something which we ought to do and do now for the long term of Singapore. So PM, why do you think we need to do it now? 25 years after the elected presidency was first put in place, why now? I think there are several reasons. First, we knew this problem was there when we made the elected presidency. Because, in fact, everybody knew, although they were very polite and they didn't bring it up in the open, but everybody knew, they sensed it, that this would make it much harder to have a Malay president or an Indian president. Mm -hmm. But at the beginning, we felt that we had time. Uh, it was a problem. It was not an immediate problem because right immediately uh, we were not having fierce elections. We were looking for candidates to become president mm -hmm. and looking very hard. And so we, we had the luxury of time to see how the thing would unfold, would develop. Uh, we've had 25 years. I think we've seen how it's worked. We've had one uh, minority elected president, Mr. Nathan, who served with dis distinction. Uh, but he was elected both times unopposed. And uh, I think he won the hearts of Singaporeans. But when he first came out, I mean, without Singaporeans knowing him well, I'm not sure how an election would have turned out. It's difficult to say. But that was unopposed. That was 1999 and then 2000 and 2005. Hi. Uh, I think that after 25 years, we have seen how things have worked out and we have seen how things have changed. And 2011, the election was a hard-fought one, very fierce. And I don't think in that kind of election, a minority will have a fair chance. And I expect in future, there will be future presidential elections, which will be as hard-fought, as um, tense. And I think that will make the problem more acute. So that's the second reason. I think things have changed after 25 years. The third reason I'm doing it now is because it's something which I feel I ought to do and I ought not to pass this on, kick the, kick the can down the road and leave it to my successor. I, I'm familiar with the system. I helped to design it in the beginning when we first introduced the system. I've um, been part of operating it and uh, amending it, improving it crafting it as we have gone along, changing the provisions to make them work. And I've worked it with Mr. Nathan and Dr. Tony Tan when, as I have been Prime Minister. So I know this problem and I think I have a responsibility to deal with it. And I think I can tell Singaporeans, I believe this is something which needs to be done and I believe it and I want to do it. And I will persuade you that it is something which we should do and which is good for Singapore. And if we don't do this, I think we will have trouble for Singapore. Not today, not tomorrow, but 10, 15 years, 20 years' time, definitely. We ought to do it now before the problems come. PM, let me pick up on the point about the last presidential election, the 2011 one, yeah. where there were four candidates, four trans, all Chinese. Some might argue that, well, it was hotly contested and it was a good example of democratic expression. Singaporeans got a chance to vote, got a chance to see candidates of different types stand the election. What would you say to that? I think it's good to have a contest, but it has to be a contest over the right issues and people must understand what this is about. I think the problem with the 2011 election, in my view, is that many of the candidates did not understand or did not accept what the president's duties are, what his constitutional role is, and what he's being elected to do. Yeah. And they made statements and promises to the voters which are really not the president's responsibility or duty or function. And if the president tries to do that sort of thing, I think the system will malfunction because <laughs> the government cannot work. There can only be one government, and the president has certain roles and duties which are to hold a second key on money and on people, but not to go and check the government or tell the government what it is supposed to do. And I think not all the candidates understood that, or maybe they did, but they thought that they, 
uh, made these statements, it would help them to win the election. But I think that is one of the difficulties of having an election for president. And there's a difficulty which we have to find some way to overcome. All right. Thank you very much, PM. We'll have to go for another break. When we come back, who can qualify to be president? What are some of the changes to the qualifying criteria?